Well, good morning. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, picking up in verse 20, and we'll go to the end of the chapter to verse 58. A study I've entitled, From Grief to Hope. Last week, we looked at the first half of the chapter, and we looked at the message of the gospel. Paul declared the gospel. He said that the gospel message is simply this, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel message. So you've got the death, the burial, the resurrection. And uh, he was talking about how the Corinthians were being confused because the Sadducees were coming in who don't believe in the resurrection and the Greek culture doesn't believe in a resurrection. You know, for them, how could these, these, these heroes uh, uh, die and come back to life? They're not supposed to die in their mindset. So the Greek culture was coming in influencing the church. And Paul says, look, without the resurrection, Christianity falls apart. You know, if you could disprove the resurrection of Jesus then our faith is useless. It, it hinges on that resurrection. It is the, the proof that the payment for our sins was sufficient. Uh, otherwise, Jesus would have been still in the grave, but he conquered it because he had never sinned. And so his payment for our sins was sufficient, conquered the grave, um, and rose from the dead. And so uh, in this section, Paul's going to talk about uh, death a little bit more and the resurrection. And it reminds me that, you know, Anytime we go through um, the loss of a loved one that, that dies, it's never easy. Whether they don't know the Lord or even if they do know the Lord, it's, it's always a difficult time. Um, I don't care who you are or how long you know the person or, or just for a short time, it's never easy. And, um, and yet we know that if they love Jesus, then we truly have hope because we get to see uh, those loved ones who have trusted in Christ again in heaven. We will be reunited and we can hold on to those promises of God. Because heaven is a real place for real people that who are prepared to be there. And, um, you know, we've all got difficulties in our life. And um, we've shared this before that my wife and I, um, right before Caleb, uh, we had a miscarriage. And, um, you know, going through that and, and um, the difficulties of it and even having uh, somebody say that it was our fault because we were under a lot of stress and... And just, you know, all these things happening in the spiritual warfare. And, and what got us through was going to God's word. We clung to God's promises. We, we looked at, at David and after um, he had fallen and, and he said, you know, I know my child cannot come to me, but I will go to my child. And we looked at the promises in the New Testament about the resurrection and the hope that we have that we be reunited with our child one day. And so there's a lot of, a lot of scriptures that we can cling to and hold to. And that's what we need to do. To be able to go from grief to hope. And so Paul's going to deal with really four uh, subjects in our passage today. And I've got them up here on the screen for you. Uh, the first is, why is there death? And will it ever end? And that'll be in verses 20 through 28. The second is, what if there's no resurrection? He touched on that last week. He'll kind of develop that a little bit more. And that's in verses 29 through 34. The third is that, uh, is, will we have a body in heaven? And that'll be verses 35 through 49. And the last thing we'll conclude with, when will we finally be in heaven? And that'll be verses 50 through 58. So with that, let's jump in here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, picking up in verse 20. We read, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. 
Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. We'll pause there and, and walk through this. Uh, immediately here in verse 20, Paul talks about the resurrection, that Christ is risen from the dead. Uh, again, that is essential to our, our Christian faith. Um, you, you can't deny the resurrection and, and still be a Christian. Uh, our faith hinges on the resurrection. And, and Paul's going to talk about that and again, uh, how the Corinthians were, were being foolish. Not all of them, but some of them were getting caught up in this that, yes, we believe Jesus died on the cross for us and that he's our Savior, um, but there's no resurrection. And just the folly of that thinking he'll, he'll talk about. Um, but first here, he mentions that, that Jesus, that, that Christ has, has risen and he's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Um, and so he, he talks about Christ being the first fruits. Um, for us, we don't always um, get it right away, but if you've read the Old Testament, you understand what he's doing here. Uh, this comes from the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 23. And what they would do is they would, during the harvest, they would bring their first fruits to the Lord as an offering. It would be the best of their crop. They would bring it to the Lord, and they would give it to the Lord as an offering. And, uh, and so they were doing that, and, and it was this offering. And he's using this imagery that Jesus Christ has become our offering. He's, he's given the best offering that can be ever be given to the Father. And through that, he's opened the door then for us to be with God forever through his sacrifice. And so Jesus is the, the first fruits um, and really the only one um, who can open that door for us. Now, Jesus, i got to be careful the way I say this. Jesus is not the first person who has risen from the dead. Uh, you remember in the Old Testament, there are examples of people rising from the dead. Um, through, through the Lord healing people. Even in the New Testament, you'll see Jesus. He did miracles. He brought people back from the dead, like Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, who was in the tomb, and he called out. Um, but the difference is, is that those people had the same body. They were kind of just reanimated. They came back to life, you know. And you see that sometimes in the hospital, that they flatline and they paddle them and they come back to life. But they're in the same body. And, you know, I feel for Lazarus, uh, because he had to come back and, and live and then die all over again. And it's like, you were there <laughs> and you had to come back to this place. And so um, the difference between those people and Jesus is that when Jesus rose from the dead, he had a glorified body. Um, remember when Thomas was in the room and he's doubting and he's like, you guys, you're pulling a fast one on me. And it kind of shows the disciples' characters because he's not believing them that, you know, you guys haven't seen Jesus. Unless I see Jesus myself, put my fingers in his hands, the prince in his hand, put my hand in his side. I don't believe you guys. You're just, you're just trying to, you know, pull one over on me. And, and, and yet Jesus is listening. He, he knows what he's saying. And it says that he walks into the room. How did he get in there? Well, with his glorified body, he could do that. He just goes in there and he says, Thomas, touch, feel, handle me. And then Thomas falls down and says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen. And, and that's us. And so uh, Jesus has risen from the dead and he's in a glorified body. And um, he's become those first fruits for us. Then he kind of contrasts um, the first man, uh, Adam, and uh, you'll notice in verse 21, if you've got a New King James, um, it says, by man, with an uppercase M. And anytime you see that, that's an indication that it's referring to uh, the deity, it's referring to God. And so this is a clear indication that this is referring to Jesus Christ, right? He's the only one that was resurrected and so um, in that body. And so he, he came... Uh, but there was a first man that brought death. So Adam brought sin and death into the world. How did that happen? Well, you got to go back to Genesis. Genesis is a very foundational book. Um, I know there's some churches that don't want to deal with Genesis, but it's so foundational to the rest of the Bible. And it's, it's key to understand why Jesus came to begin with. Why did he come to rescue us? Well, because of something called sin. Uh, Adam and Eve had sinned against God. They rebelled against Him. Uh, God gave Adam a command that there was a tree in the Garden of Eden that they were not supposed to eat of. 
Um, and so they went to the tree, and, you know, human nature, you kind of, well, which tree is it? You know, how close can I get to it? I'm not eating, and I'm just right next to it. And, and then Satan comes and tempts Eve, and, and she sees that it's, it's good to eat, and that it could make her wise, and, and she covets it. She desires it. And what's fascinating is there in Genesis 3, it says that Adam is right there with her, right beside her. So Eve was deceived, but Adam willfully disobeyed God. He knew the command that God had given him and was passive, didn't, didn't um, say, you know, hon, we shouldn't talk to snakes. God's given us authority over them, and God told us not to, t- to eat the fruit of this tree. Let's obey God. But he didn't do that. So he rebelled against God, brought sin and death into the world. And God told him, the day you eat of that tree, you will die. And what's fascinating, in the Hebrew, the word there is actually a double. It's die, dying. And so, it wasn't talking about a physical death. It was talking about a spiritual death. And right afterward, you see God coming to the garden, and he's saying, where are you? Now, God knows everything. It's not like he made Adam and, and Eve the first people. and was like, oh no. Where did I put these people? I already lost them. Where are you guys? No. What he was saying was, where are you spiritually? That closeness of a father to a son. There's something between us. We're no longer close. You've done something that's caused this distance between us. And so God is trying to invite him back to fellowship. Where are you? And, and Adam confesses uh, through blaming Eve and, you know, all that. And, um, and so through Adam, he brought sin and ultimately death into this world. Um, but if you look here, that Jesus, he brought life and forgiveness. How did Jesus do that? Well, he came from heaven. And he lived that perfect, sinless life that we could never live. And then willfully, he went to the cross, laid down his life for us, was buried in that tomb for three days, and then conquered. He rose from the dead on his own. And uh, he has the ability to give us forgiveness and life and life eternal. And so uh, Christ is, is the better uh, over Adam. And we'll kind of see this contrast continue on. Um, but in verse 23, he says, uh, But to each one in his own order, the Christ the firstfruits, and afterward those who are at Christ at his coming. Verse 24, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he puts it end to all rule and all authority and power. So Jesus Christ came the first time as the Savior. Right? He came to save us from our sins. He's going to come back a second time to establish his kingdom, to rule righteously, to, to, to judge. And, you know, the Jews had a really hard time with that. They looked at the Old Testament, they saw the prophecies, they saw that he was going to be a suffering servant, but also establish his kingdom. And even the disciples had a hard time with that. They said, Lord, is it this time that you're going to establish your kingdom? Hey, can I sit at your left hand or your right hand? And Jesus is saying, you guys, you don't know what you're asking for, you know. This isn't is this isn't that time, and so um, it's kind of like when you look at a mountain range, right? Uh, from a distance, you can see a couple mountain peaks, and they look like they're close to each other. Um, but the, the the closer you get to those mountain peaks, you can tell there's this huge valley between them. And so that first mountain peak was the first coming of Christ. The second one was the second coming. And for the Jews, they say, "Look, they're right next to each other. It's got to happen in succession." And yet, the closer you get, there's this huge valley of time. And so, Jesus has come the first time to suffer and die for us. But there's this valley of time, and he's coming back any day. He's going to rapture us up, and then uh, after the seven years, he's going to establish his kingdom for a thousand years. And then we'll live in eternity with him. And so, Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. um, And he's going to deliver... Uh, This kingdom is going to put an end to all the stuff that's going on here. And he is going to have all the authority and power to rule and to reign over everything. Now, verses 25 through 27 has brought some confusion. And hopefully I can help clear that up. Um, But this is the father talking to the son about authority. And um, he says that he must reign till he has put all our enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he, the Father, has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is expected. And the one who's expected is Jesus Christ. 
And so the expression here, under his feet, it's an Old Testament figure, uh, a language that's used for total conquest. Um, in fact, if you go to some of the cultures overseas today and you show them the bottom of your feet, it's an insult um, because they understand what that means. And so um, to put on your feet means total conquest. It means that you are higher than them, that you've got authority over them. So the father's put all things under the authority of his son. And that includes death. And that's what this verse is saying. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And, and that's good news. Um, that death is one day going to be destroyed. You know, and, and it's going to be gone forever. And so that's going to be exciting. That one day there will be no more death. Uh, it will be, it'll be destroyed. Death will die. Uh, if that makes any sense. And so one day Jesus will finally and forever put all the enemies under his feet. Including our enemy death and completely destroy it um, and that's good news now verse 28 he says now when all things are um, made subject to him then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all and I love what Paul does here he reminds us of the Godhead that there is authority within the Trinity that the spirit is subject to the son and the son is subject to the father and and yet it, it messes with our mind that um, how can there be three distinct persons and yet one God? That's what the Bible teaches. And it's as great as this, this mystery of godliness. That there's one God who's chosen to reveal himself in three different ways. Um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All God and only one. Um, and so it, it's hard for us to fully comprehend. Uh, but that's what the Bible teaches. And we believe it. And so Paul here is talking about that there's an order in the Trinity, an order in the Godhead. And he tells us here that Jesus is always in submission to his Father. You remember that Jesus said, I always do the will of my Father. Now, I so wish I could say that. I so wish I could say, you know, I always do the will of my Father. But I don't. <laughs> there are times that we do our own will. We do what we want. And uh, that's why we need Jesus Christ and His help uh, to help us to do the, the will of the Father. And grateful He's given us His Holy Spirit who helps us um, to be subject to Him. So, in this first part, why is there death? Will it ever end? Again, why is there death? Because Adam and Eve sinned. And if we were there, if we're honest, we would have done the exact same thing. Uh, we would have sinned. Uh, we would have rebelled against God. Um, and, and God gave man free will. He didn't want us to be robots, right? If you had, you know, our, our, our kids, they've got this little dancing weird bunny thing. And these toys are getting more strange, but you can push little buttons and it says, I love you and, and those sort of things. And, and yet I know when we push that button, we don't feel loved by that, by this little, you know, dancing bunny rabbit thing. Um, and, and it's, you know, we're, we're causing it because we're pushing this button. And God doesn't want that with us, right? He can pull the string on our back or push a button and we say, I love you, God. I'm excited to worship you. No, that would be forced. He wants it from our perspective. He wants our, our free will uh, to be exercised so that we can make a choice. And that's true love. Uh, the other way is manipulation. God never forces anything upon us. He always gives us a choice. And that's love. Um, and, and we've learned that in relationships. If you try and force someone to do something, that's manipulation. If you give them a choice, that's love. Because you're allowing them to respond. And God's always the initiator. And we simply respond. So there's death because of what Adam has done. He rebelled and sinned. And will it ever end? Yes, it will. There will come a day where death will be destroyed. And Paul will talk a little bit about that later as we continue. Well, what if there's no resurrection? Paul addresses that next in verses 29 through 34. And verse 29 he says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? 
If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness, and do not let sin for some, or excuse me, awake to righteousness, and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. I'll pause there. Now, this is a confusing passage, I gotta admit. Uh, one commentary I read said there were over 30 different interpretations. One of them um, on the internet, I don't know if it's true, but said there were about 200 interpretations on this. So, uh, we don't have time to look at all 30 of those interpretations. I'll give you a couple that I think are, are valid and I think uh, can hold weight. Um, but I do want to point out something here in verse 29. You know, Paul does not say, we baptize for the dead. It's not something that they were doing. Uh, he's simply asking, uh, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? And why are they being baptized for the dead? Well, again, there's kind of two uh, ideas here. Um, the first is that the baptism of the dead was a, a very pagan practice, um, that non-believers were doing this, and, um, and it was part of the, uh, the regions of Greece um, that they were doing this. And, and in fact, it's actually still practiced today uh, by some cults. Um, they believe that you can... Uh, it's almost like purgatory, that you can get baptized in honor of someone and, and get them out of the pit to heaven. Um, and, and it's just totally against the scriptures. Um, we know that we get to make that choice. We, we can't force anyone to come to Christ, whether they're alive, let alone dead. Um, their fate is sealed. And so uh, there's no purgatory. Um, there's no way that we can get baptized or save someone who's already passed on. It's their own choice whether or not they accepted Christ or rejected Christ. Um, and so, you know, the culture that was going on, they were practicing it. Um, and Paul clearly does not approve of this practice by any means. Um, and so with this first interpretation, the point would be, well, look, the pagans have a sense to believe in the resurrection because they're doing this. But even you Corinthians uh, who, who claim to be Christians, you don't even believe in the resurrection. And so again, he's trying to, to show them their, their silliness and their thinking here. Um, now, another interpretation, which I think um, holds a lot of weight as well, uh, is that this could be talking about evangelism or the public witness of those who are martyred. And that's kind of my personal view, is, is I would agree with that uh, interpretation. I, I see a lot of weight there, uh, because Paul talks about his time in Ephesus, that there were some beasts that he fought. And uh, oftentimes what they would do is they would take Christians into a coliseum or to an uh, arena, and the animals would come out, and it would be entertainment for them to watch these Christians be martyred. Um, and so supposedly, uh, Paul had fought with some beasts in Ephesus. We're not entirely sure. The Bible doesn't give us the detail. But it's very possible that he um, protected his own life from being killed by a, a wild beast. And, and again, a lot of people were being killed as Christians, and yet there were a lot of spectators. And what I believe this is, is saying, again, this is my personal take on it, um, and I, there's a couple of people that have supposed this, and I, I think they're, they're right on, is that uh, people in the audience would watch these people stand for Christ. They would say, you know, these Christians love Jesus. They love this God that's risen from the dead, and, and they're not doing anything to hurt anyone. And look at their faith. Look at how much they will stand up for this God that they can't even see. And yet, here, I don't even, I can't even stand for anything. And, and I want boldness. I want a passion. I want a life like that. And so people were coming to Christ through these people's witness. And they were going and saying, you know, I, I want to get baptized because of so-and-so. I saw them. They were martyred in the arena. And it had such an impact on me. And, and I want to get baptized in, in recognition that because of them laying down their life, um, I am who I am today because of their witness. And I think that's, that's probably what Paul is saying here. Again, there's 30 interpretations, so you can agree to disagree, as long as you disagree agreeably. Um, but with the second interpretation, uh, his point is clear. That the pagans, again, have a sense of hope, of heaven. Um, you know, that watching people become martyred and, and having this hope for an afterlife of the resurrection from the dead. Um, you know, they, they want to come to Christ and, and, and be baptized uh, in honor of those that they've seen laying down their lives. Yet some of you Corinthian Christians, you still don't hold to the resurrection. 
And so uh, whatever was going on, uh, Paul's point is that they had, they had been deceived. And they had stopped believing in the resurrection. And, um, and we see him say that here uh, in verse uh, 32, that if there is no resurrection, if the dead do not rise, well, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And, um, you know, you've probably heard people say that, that, you know, if there's no afterlife, if there's no judgment, hey, let's eat, drink, be merry, and, and make the most of this life, for that's it, you know. When your time is up, it's up. Um, and Paul is saying that this is, this is a false teaching. That you've been corrupted. And we see him call him out here. In verse 33 he says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And so bad company had corrupted their thinking. And led them astray. And we want to be very careful with what we let into our mind. Whether it's on TV or through music or through books and magazines. Whether it's through people we associate with as friends. They can affect our thinking. And I remember... Uh, I remember uh, in our youth group out in California, um, there were a couple of kids that were uh, students that were uh, getting into some trouble, and a couple of the, the kids that were on fire for the Lord were were associating with the kids. And, and I just challenged them, "Hey, look, uh, if you want to know where you're going to be in five years from now, take a look at those around you, because they're going to have an influence on your life, and that can either be a bad thing or a good thing." And so we want to associate ourselves with those who are loving Jesus. Now, are we going to reach out to those who don't know Christ? Yes. Uh, but we want to make sure our, our close friends, our best friends, are those who love Jesus Christ. And so we also want to be careful with what we put in our mind. Because we can be deceived. And uh, I think one of the ways that uh, the culture has really shifted is through uh, music and through movies. You know, I'm sure you've heard this excuse, and, and I think every generation has said it, but, you know, well, I don't really listen to the song for the lyrics, I just really like the beats, you know, and I remember offering those people, hey, I can get a Christian album, it's got the same beats, it's got better lyrics, would you listen to it? No, no, I wouldn't. Okay, well, there's something else going on. And the reality is that music teaches, it's a language, it's a, it's a communication, and, and, and even in the church, we have to be careful with the songs that we select because it's teaching something about God. And so we want to make sure we're not deceived, that we're not getting off track. And so um, we want to make sure that we're, we're constantly grounded in the Word of God because this bad company can corrupt us. And so we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're following Jesus Christ and we're having His perspective on the eternal matters. Well, verse 34, Paul says, uh, he gives them a prescription here. He says, awake to righteousness. Essentially, wake up. Stop being deceived. And, and do not sin. You know, that some of the people, they don't have the knowledge of God. And he says, I speak this to your shame. So he exhorts them, wake up. Uh, the time is running out. Make sure you really know Jesus Christ. Make sure you really know this God that you claim you know who rose from the dead. Make sure you're trusting in the right Jesus. And if you ever talk to people about Jesus, um, you'll find that there are a lot of people that have a different Jesus they trust in. Um, there's a lot of false um, gods out there, small g. Some believe in a Jesus that um, will improve their life and give them health, wealth, and prosperity. And never anything will go wrong in your life. And, you know, it's this, this beautiful, smooth sailing life. Um, and that's not the Jesus of the Bible. He says there's going to be trials and heartaches, but he's there with us through those storms. And uh, he doesn't um, promise to prosper, you know, to give us prosperity financially, uh, but spiritually. Now those financial blessings come as we, we sow and we practice the teachings and instructions he gives us. But primarily he's concerned with our heart, right? He wants us to be with them in heaven. You could do all the things of the Bible that it says and yet miss the whole intention, which is this relationship with God. And so he's exhorting them to make sure that they really have uh, a relationship with this God, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is so key. Um, you know, you have to have this personal relationship. And, and Paul will kind of deal with that a little bit more um, as, we, as we look at the, the final section in this chapter. Um, but some people were asking, um, when we get to heaven, are we going to have a body? And Paul talks about that next here in verses 35 through 49. 
He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. What you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We'll pause there and, and walk through this together. Um, so the question is, will we have a body in heaven? And, and right off here in verse 36, Paul says, you know, some were saying, you know, are the dead raised and what body do they come? And he corrects my verse 36 and says, foolish, um, you know, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. So he talks about us being made alive. And if you've ever looked at, uh, at seeds, um, you take that seed and you put it in the ground and in essence, it, it kind of dies. And then after a while, as you're watering, it begins to grow into this plant. And what's fascinating is you can take the same a seed and and you can you know they're all small and and you can plant a seed and you get you know corn you can plant a seed and you get this huge oak tree you can plant a seed and get this huge redwood tree but they all come from this little tiny seed and so uh, it, it comes alive and uh, and and Paul gives us really these three pictures the first one is here with seeds and verse thirty six to thirty eight so again it, you know even scientists are still trying to figure out the process of how you uh, you take a seed, and how does it grow? How does it become alive? They've got all this information on photosynthesis and you know, a lot of stuff, but but still they cannot replicate. They can't produce a seed on their own. It has to come from a tree. And so uh, what's fascinating here is that God uses this picture in that you can't just make man. A man has to come from man, right? Humans come from humans. And... Um, and yet, one day that when we die, this body will go in the ground. We'll get a new body. Um, it'll be something beautiful. Um, and then he also talks about here in verse 39, different kinds of flesh. Animals versus people. Um, and, and animals, they don't have um, this, the living soul. Um, we do. I know that troubles people if animals go to heaven or not. I don't know. We see animals in the millennium. Uh, but I can tell you there's some pets I don't want there to be in heaven. <laughs> they, they were kind of mean to me. Um, but we have a soul. We have that living soul within us. And, uh, you know, Jesus talked about that. What is a profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So we have that living soul within us. And, uh, and that soul will carry on into eternity. And, um, and then in verses 40 through 41, he... T he Contrast the celestial versus the, the terrestrial. The celestial is the stars in space, in outer space. And if you ever looked at you know, the pictures of the Hubble telescope or those sort of things, uh, images from NASA, just amazing, just beautiful, breathtaking. You look at these, you know, the, the horse nebula and these uh, nebulas that have exploded and look like the eyeball. And, 
And, you know, is that the eye of God? And, and just amazing, just so stunning. Um, and that's yet one kind of glory. And then there's the terrestrial glory. Look at the earth and all the beauty around us, even in the fallen world. You know, you go to a national park and you're just, just amazed at the beauty of it. Um, and if you've ever watched the sun rise or the sun set, um, you just think, man, amazing. Every day it's different. You look at the clouds. Every day it's different. Uh, it's unique every single day. Um, and so there's a different kind of glory compared there. And, um, and so he talks about that, that there's one kind of glory of the sun, another glory of the moon. Right? We know the moon is a reflection of the sun. The moon doesn't really give off its own light. It just simply reflects it. And there's another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. The point he's trying to make here is that, and that each of these have a different glory. That we get to heaven, we're not going to all have the same body. We're not going to all look exactly the same. It's going to be some sort of our, our body we have now, but a huge upgrade. And so we're going to be able to recognize each other. We're going to be able to, 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 to relate with each other. But we're not all going to look alike. That would be kind of weird. That would be a little, a little bit odd. Um, but we'll all have this, this new body um, that we're going to be getting. And so verses 42 through 44, he talks about that. How um, the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in incorruption, it's raised in incorruption. So the bodies we plant in the grave are not the bodies that we'll be resurrected with. We'll have new bodies that will be spiritual, incorruptible, and perfectly adapted to heaven. We'll finally have that perfect body. And I remember um, 10 years ago uh, when I first went to Calvary Chapel, California. And I remember one of the elders talking about this and how excited they were. And I'm thinking, what? I like my body. You know, here I'm 21 years old at that time. And I'm thinking, this is, this is a great body. And yet over time now being, you know, coming up to 32 here and, and I'm realizing this body is not going to last forever at this rate. How am I going to even make it to 60? You know, it's like this body's breaking down. And, and I, it excites me because I know that when we get that new body, it won't break. It'll continue on. And, and it seems like for me, every other month, I injure one of my toes. They've all been purple or bruised up. And, um, and one of them I'm broken seems about like three times every year. And I just think, Lord, I'm, I'm excited because I can get a body. I can finally go through the walls and, and float and do all those sort of things. And, and, and we'll have perfect bodies. They won't break down. They won't deteriorate. They won't have any aches or pains. Um, and there'll be no crying. And so we'll have this, these perfect bodies when we get there. And, um, and so in verses 45 through 49... Uh, he talks about um, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Uh, remember in Genesis that God formed and fashioned mankind. You know, he spoke uh, the world into existence. But when it came to man, he formed and fashioned him from the, the earth. And then he breathed life into him uh, and became a living being. And so Adam became this, this first. Um, and yet there was a second man in verse 47. And again, if you've got the New King James, you'll notice that that man is uppercase, M, uh, and that's speaking of Jesus. And if it's not clear, he says, the man is the Lord from heaven. We know that's clearly Jesus Christ, right? He came uh, to this earth. Uh, and so, Jesus is the ultimate uh, capital M for man. And uh, Adam came from the earth. It was made of dust, just like we are. In fact, in Genesis 3.19, it says, For dust you are, and to dust you will return. But Jesus is different. Jesus has always existed. He's always been God. He didn't become uh, into existence at, at the birth. Uh, he's, he was already in existence. So what happened was he came, and he chose to come through Mary to live a life here, uh, to be our example, to lay down his life for us, that he could reconcile us back to himself, back to the Father. And so through his sacrifice, we have that, that fellowship. Um, and what's, what's exciting here is that if we abide in Jesus, we've trusted in him, then we're going to have that glorified body like him. And uh, so will we have a body in heaven? Yes. Will it be this body? No, no, no. It will be much better. It will be a body that's just like... You're, you know, 
be like better than Superman. You know, it'll never deteriorate. Uh, you can probably go faster than a speeding bullet and all those sort of things. It'll be like a body like Jesus. You know, it'll be a resurrected body. You can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, ultimately, it'll be for glorifying Jesus. And so, uh, wherever Jesus is, that's where we want to be and glorify Him. So, we will have a body, and it's going to be an awesome body when we get there. God will give us a huge upgrade. It'll be a major upgraded uh, body that we'll have there. Well, uh, next, um, Paul deals with the, the question of when will we finally be in heaven? In verses 50 through uh, 58. And we read, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This last section, Paul deals with the question is, when will we be to heaven? And he starts off here in verse 50, uh, telling us that our physical bodies won't make it to heaven. He says, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And for me, that reminds me of John chapter 3, where Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. You remember that? Nicodemus was the, one of the religious leaders, and, uh, and he begins to kind of flatter Jesus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he goes, what does that mean? I, I got born once. My mom had me. You know, I came out. I cried. How do I go back in her womb a second time? That's... That's really strange. I can't be born again that way. And Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Man, okay. Let's start at the beginning again. He talks about how uh, the flesh produces flesh, but the spirit is life-giving. And so, the word there for born again really is talking about being born from above. We've been born of this earth through our parents. Right? We've all got parents that, that that's why we're here. I won't go into the details. Um, but we have to be born spiritually. We have to be born from above. And that's when we become born again. God's Spirit comes and lives within us. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We can't lose our salvation. And uh, we're secure in our salvation in the Lord because we've trusted in Jesus and His finished work on the cross for us. Um, and so through that, we have to be born again. If you're not born again, you're not going to make it to heaven. You have to have God's Spirit within you to bring you to Him. And so, although he does mention something here that's really fascinating, verses 51 and 52, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, that we shall not all sleep. Again, anytime you see the word sleep, it's a polite way of talking about death. Um, and so we're not all going to, to die, but we shall all be changed. And the moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. So, this speaks of the rapture. And uh, i got to share this real quick. Uh, I remember uh, it was at a church we were visiting, and they had this verse in the church's nursery room. And I thought, that's really odd. And then, and then I laughed, because then it made sense. It said, you know, uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And I thought, that's, that's hilarious. You know, all these little babies, <laughs> they're not sleeping, but they're going to get their diapers changed. That's for sure. Um, so I thought that was funny, but, but I'm like, well, it's not really the context of that verse, but you can get some humor out of that. Um, but this verse is really talking about the rapture. Uh, it's talking to us about us being with the Lord in, in a moment. And, and that's exciting. The rapture can happen any time. It could happen right now. Uh, it could happen today or tomorrow or next week. We're not sure. Um, but the rapture is going to happen. And Paul tells us in verse 52 what's going to happen. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
that's faster than, a, than you blink. Uh, at that last trumpet, uh, the trumpet's going to sound and the dead will be raised and, and we're going to be changed. It, just in a split second, um, it's going to happen. And so Paul tells us what happens at the rapture. Now, some people say that the trumpet here, this last trumpet, is the seventh trumpet of judgment mentioned in the book of Revelation. But if you actually understand the Greek language and take a look at the construction here, it doesn't support that. Uh, it would have to be completely different uh, construction of the, of the Greek language, which, which is what the New Testament was written in, for, it, for that to, to be possible. Um, Clearly, when you, when you understand the context here and, and the way that the Greek language is used, uh, this is talking about a trumpet that's calling people home. It's a trumpet that's going to call us to heaven. Um, so clearly, that is the rapture. And again, some people will argue, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, I've heard it. Um, well, you know, the rapture, that word isn't in the Bible, just like Trinity, and you Christians, you kind of make it up. And, and, and I actually... Uh, take them to to um, uh, First Thessalonians chapter four, where it talks about that as well. And, and what's fascinating is that word, the rapture. Sure, it's not in our English Bibles, but it's actually in the Latin Bibles, and that's where that word comes from. Uh, it's it's the Latin word uh, rapturos or rapturo, and it simply means a snatching away, a carrying off, or a transport. So. Uh, the concept of God transporting a rapture in the church is clearly taught in the Bible. And if you ever hear someone say, you know, rapture is in the Bible. Well, actually it is. It's in the Latin Bible. But since we don't speak Latin, uh, we've kind of carried that word over. Um, you know, because at the time when the Bible was mainly in the Latin language, people were excited about the rapture. They wanted to cling to that. Life wasn't easy. And they knew God's going to come back. He's going to take us home. And so that could happen any day. Um, no one knows the day or the hour. And there's a lot of people that try and guess, but uh, it's up to him when he wants us to come home. And he'll transport us and, and take us to be with them forever. Um, so some people will not taste death uh, physically. Their, their bodies aren't going to die. They'll just be raptured. And I hope and pray that this is, that's this generation. Uh, I think if you look at what's going on in the Middle East, it's coming soon. How soon? I don't know. I'm not God. But I'm excited. It could happen. Um, we'll be ready when it does. Um, but some people are going to have to uh, to go through um, and experience death. And I hope and pray that, again, that's not us, that we get raptured. Um, but in verse 54 and 55, he says that death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So death is swallowed up in victory only because of what Jesus Christ has done. He's removed the sting of death. By rising from the dead, he's conquered the penalty of death um, uh, that we deserve because we've sinned. And, and he's swallowed it up in his victory by rising from the dead. And he's forgiven us our sins. So one day, like Jesus in verse 55, we can say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Because there will come a day where death will be no more. Now, if the Lord tarries and we're, we die, we're going to be absent from this body. We'll be present with the Lord in heaven. But people on earth will still die. But what this is saying is there will come a day where God will destroy death. Uh, there will be no, no one dying. Everyone will be living. And there will be no more death anywhere. And so uh, that's going to be an exciting day. Uh, death, the final enemy, will be destroyed and gone. Um, in verse 56, he tells us a bit more about this. He says that the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. So again, death is the result of sin. And, and that's why we all die. It's because we're all sinners. Um, every one of us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And uh, we've all missed that mark. And that's what the word sin means. It, it's an archery term. Uh, again, that if you were going to hit the bullseye, and let's say you, you, you know, pulled back your bow and you shot that arrow and you hit that bullseye 99 times. And the 100th time you missed, they would say you sinned. You missed perfection. You didn't hit that bullseye every time. And we know we've sinned. And he says that um, the law is the strength of the sin. The law, the Ten Commandments, is a mirror. It shows us just how much we have sinned. And, and if you ever think, man, I'm not a sinner. I'm not really that bad. Look at the Ten Commandments. It'll be the mirror. It'll show you, oh, I got some dirty spots. Yeah, I still need the Lord to work in that area. And, and it reminds us that 
We need Christ. You know, the law is a schoolmaster. It's to bring us to Jesus Christ. It can't save us. It can only carry us to the cross. And there we find our victory in what Jesus has done for us. So it's in what Jesus Christ has done for us that we have our victory. So our hope and our victory is in Jesus. And I love how Paul concludes here in verses 57 and 58. He says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our victory is in Jesus Christ. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We fight from the victory that Jesus has already given to us. Um, Our victory is in Jesus Christ. And uh, because of that, we should be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And, and he, I love what he says here, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. At times we can get weary. At, at times we can get uh, discouraged. At times we can feel, why bother? Um, this isn't making a difference. But the reality is, we need to know that the work that we do for the Lord is not in vain. It's going to have an eternal uh, uh, eternal weight of glory. It's going to be an eternal uh, change and transformation in people's lives around us. And we get to heaven, we're going to run into people and, and we're going to be surprised by the impact that we had on their life. And so do not lose heart um, because our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that our hope is in you. That our, our, our all in all is in you, Jesus. That we can go from grief to hope. That as we, we look to you, we cling to your promises, Lord. We know that we have hope. That we are holding on patiently, expecting your return. We know that you're going to come soon and you're going to take us home. Whether that's collectively or individually, Lord. We, we know that one day we're going to be with you face to face in heaven. And God, we, we know that you're our only hope. You're the only hope for America. You're the only hope for our world. You're the only hope for our friends and our family. You're our only hope. And our hope is in you, Jesus. And so may we just continue to cling to your promises of your word. May we continue to cling to you, Jesus, as our hope, as our, as our way, our truth in our life. Uh, may we just continue to be steadfast and immovable in our love for you and in the faith that, that we have in you, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that if there's any here among us this morning that don't know you, they don't have that personal relationship with you, they're not sure that if they were to die today or if the rapture happened, that they'd be with you. Lord, we pray that they would come to their senses, they'd realize how much you love them, that, that you died for them, that you want to forgive them of all their sins. That you want to be that Heavenly Father that they've never had. That you want to have that beautiful, intimate, uh, personal relationship with. And as every Christian here is praying and every head is bowed, if that's you this morning and he, you've, you're not born again, you haven't given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that today. We're not asking you to join Calvary Chapel. We have no church membership. We're asking you to join Jesus Christ. We're asking you to, to give your life to the one who loves you, sacrifice sacrifice himself for you so you can be forgiven. If that's you, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. Come into my life and forgive me. Make me a new person. Save me. I want to be with you in heaven forever. And if that's you, I'm, I'm just going to pray a prayer and encourage you to, to mean it from your heart and repeat that after me. God, I realize that I am a sinner and I know that my sin separates me from you. I now understand that this is why Jesus came to this earth. To suffer and die on that cross for my sins. That he was buried in that tomb. And that he rose from the dead. And he wants to forgive me. And I ask that you would forgive me, Lord. I ask that you would forgive me of all the stuff I've done. I ask that you would clean me. Make me a new person. I ask that you would... Seal me with your Holy Spirit, that I can know that if I were to go today, I'd be with you forever. And I thank you for your promise that I will. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for being my Savior 
and my Lord and my friend. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if that's you this morning and it was your first time to pray to receive Jesus, I want to encourage you to come let me know. Uh, let the people know who brought you. Um, if maybe it was a rededication, I encourage you to still let somebody know there's no greater decision you'll ever make than to give your life to Jesus Christ.